Hello, and welcome to Strange Dominions, where we attempt to unlock the mysteries behind the unseen and unheard, unknown and unknowable. I am your host, Octavian Grave. Tonight, Ian and I speak with J.R. Mascaro, author of Seal, Sigil, and Call. We discuss his journey through magic, eidolons, spirits, and so much more. If you've seen something strange or unusual, such as cryptids, spirits, UFOs, or anything in between, please send us an email at strangedominionspodcast at gmail.com. There is a Patreon segment for this episode. To become a patron, it's only $4 a month, and you get exclusive content such as episodes, segments, merchandise, and much more. With all that being said, I bring you our interview with J.R. Mascaro. All right, tonight, Ian and I are speaking with J.R. Mascaro, author of Sigil, Seal, and Call. How are you doing tonight, J.R.? Doing well. That's Seal, Sigil, and Call. Oh, uh, okay. My bad. <laughs> no worries. I'm doing very well. How are you? Very good. It's a pleasure to have you on here. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So, is this your first book? This is my first book. Dude, that's yes, that's I'm, exciting. Uh, it is exciting. <laughs> All right. So tell before, you know, we start digging into the book, uh, how is it writing your first book on on magic and the occult? It was a surreal process. It was kind of a, a synchronicity storm there because I'd wanted to write it for a while. I've been involved in, in this practice in some form or another since I was very young. Uh, something that kind of just came to me. Uh, and I've been pursuing ever since, uh, pretty voraciously. But it happened to be actually that I was uh, out of work during COVID for a little while. And I said to myself, I said, this, is, this is the time. I have no distractions. No, uh, no day job is calling me uh, and taking my energy. And it's a time to sit and be introspective. And I spent uh, about two and a half, three weeks writing what would be the first third of the book uh and it just kind of spiraled from there you know there was interest uh people wanted to hear what i was writing uh and i was super super happy to share so it's been a really transformative experience it's been uh humbling uh that people would want to experience what what i've written and i really hope people find benefit in it you know, I've read through. I haven't. I haven't quite finished your book, but for a first foray into literature, I have to say you've done a very good job. So, Thank you. and it's been a very pleasure to read. And I think our listeners, if they check out this book, are going to find it as well. And I know we have a lot of different perspectives on magic and the occult, and you know, personal, you know, magical work and mystical work that come on this show. And we all we all are different, but I found I found a likeness in your backstory, so to speak, and, you know, your creation of your own system out of, you know, as you describe it and you describe it in the book is you, you know, you, you kind of chafed against a specific, you know, lifelong dedication to different magical traditions. That's right. Kind of earlier on. So it's, and I found that valuable because I, I felt that too. It's like, there's so much material and truth in the occult and magical landscape, so many traditions from across the world. But it seems that you kind of, you said, you know, these are all cool tools, but then you kind of face the universe and your own path itself and let that kind of be your teacher. At least that's what I took from it. So well, on that note, so. yeah. So how did you get started on your path? So Before maybe you even knew what it was. Yes, it was. It was before I knew what it was. Uh, concerned my family when I was very young. Uh, since before I could write my name, uh, I've been drawing stuff, <laughs> and some of it is stuff that's pretty heavy with uh, with history. You know, universal hexagrams and various seals and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, and you know, I I believe that is something that was echoing from from past incarnations. Uh, and as soon as I was able to get my hands on books on the subject, uh, I, there, there I was. I was going for it. And it didn't take me very long to understand that I see the world a little differently than most people I meet. Uh, 
you know, I, I've always been listening for messages. I've always been feeling and seeing the energy around me and kind of following that thought pulse, that pattern to things. Uh, and it's just led me on my way. Uh, so it's kind of something that is within and around me to the point that I don't think I really had a, a deliberate point where I chose to follow the path. I think I've been on the path for as long as I have memory. I can appreciate that answer. I can appreciate that answer. So, you know, you get into your book and you present your book as more or less, you know, something that can be utilized and appreciated by somebody who's starting out and first figuring out their path. What were some of the key points that you developed throughout your path that you know, you developed over time that you think are the most important for people approaching your book and the system you created. And, and also, you know, you've kind of created your own system and you also, you kind of present that other people, whether new at the art or more advanced, should take that opportunity to do themselves. Why, why do you think following your own path and kind of creating your own system is valuable as a magician? It's valuable uh, for several reasons. And I think one of the paramount ones is that we are all unique. We are all mm -hmm. our own creature. Uh, and something that works wonderfully for some person might not work wonderfully for the next person, or it might not resonate with them as personally as they would prefer. Uh, and for me, being able to find what called to me in all of the methodologies and modalities that I read and had the honor to participate in over the course of my life uh, was very valuable. It was very valuable to find those kernels of the truth that resonated with myself and then you know, alchemize them, synthesize them into their own way of doing things. So everything feels right. Uh, instead of saying, well, I, I've done this, you know, and this ritual feels excellent, uh, but this other ritual in the same you know, tradition maybe isn't going for the same goals I'm going uh, or isn't resonating with the way I like to do things. So mm -hmm. that's really been of great benefit is being able to say, this is wholly mine. Uh, everything here feels right. Um, as well as the ability to not feel confined. Uh, one thing is, you know, I, I talk about this in my book, I have ADHD and I'm not great with, you know, organizational structure imposed on me from the outside. Uh, and I've always been someone who asks why to everything. So when they're saying, well, you need to do these, you know, 16 rituals in a row, I'll say, well, I don't, I don't like this one. And then all of a sudden there's, there's a schedule around it. There is a, you know, it becomes like a, like a school, like a class, like saying, well, if I don't do this, then yeah. You know, and it can, I, it can I feel graduate. like it drains the magic you approached it for originally. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes I, I also I'm very similar in, in in my way and how my mind works. And I've had the same difficulties, especially when I was younger. That's really and, interesting. Uh, somebody, yeah. Because uh, I have ADD. Um, and the thing that I've always told people is that, you know, one of my my main interest in magic kind of stems from the uh, medieval and Renaissance grimoire tradition. And a lot of people don't like that because of how structured it is and how um, very kind of rigid it is in its structure. And the, a lot of people will look at me and know me and, and my, how my brain works. And they're like, why are you so into this? I mean, it's so counter to everything you're into. And I have to explain to them that my brain is such a, uh, a mess and it's constantly going in 20 different directions. And it's really nice to have a system that I can dig into and will set me on a rigid, like it will give me a structure and it's laid out in a way that I can understand and it will give me some discipline. And a lot of people, and I think a lot of people find that their brain is already so disciplined that they don't want their magic to be that way. They, they want it to be very free form and kind of open-ended. Whereas for me, it's very much the opposite. My brain really needs that kind of uh, anchor to, to get anything out of it. Yeah. And I can, I can understand that uh, for me, the way it has manifested for me is for my magic. I really appreciate kind of limitless creative freedom. 
Uh, but oh yeah, me too. Structure, yeah, but structure for me comes from other things in my life. Essentially, because I'm not good at imposing my own structure, I've had structure imposed upon me for a long time. You know, at, at work, at school, things like that. So my magic for me was this is where I get to allow the way I think to weave itself into a spiritual practice. Um, so yeah, that's how it's always been for me. But I can definitely see. You know, I, I know some people friends of mine who have very similar to you in that way whereas you know they're also people with add and they also would rather have it you know structured but for me i i get my structure in other places i think it just says something to you know not only how we define magic but the universe is itself how how it's so infinite and capable of, of transforming to not only meet us but you know how it's in us as well like how magic and spirit, how we are a part of that. And it adapts into forms in ways that are good for us, how our minds work and how our hearts work mm -hmm. and to our needs as well. And, you know, it's, it's, it's unlimited in that sense. Like there's every direction you go and truly evolves as you explore it into, you know, an infinite uniqueness almost and I, you know i say infinite uniqueness and you mentioned the hexagram uh there's one of the the key words in the old hexagram ritual uh, essentially is talking about the uniqueness of the divine and i just had that thought speaking of hexagram rituals um how much traditional i don't want to call it like lodge magic but how much traditional like um filming maker or golden dawn like that kind of lodge magic ritual work do you incorporate in your path i know you've redefined it and i asked because i i also have a free form method and i have incorporated a lot of that throughout my life into sometimes dimensions of magic that they're not usually used for but i find them valuable so i was wondering and i know you've developed your own techniques and i'm really impressed about how you um kind of take apart some basic work like the lbrp and you know working with energy towards chakras and you re i'm gonna say re apply it but you put it in a way that's both practical and general in the best way so people can adapt it to their own system which suggests you have a knowledge of what those energies are doing internally and externally so but back to my question um how do you incorporate you know that tradition of magic and those rituals into your practice now that they you've taken them and redefined them and pulled them apart and where do you find value there so for me, a lot of my first exposure to you know, what we would consider ritual magic comes from, you know, those sort of books like Lemma, Eddie Crowley, et cetera, uh, Greg Arday, uh, who, you know, my LBRP is pretty much you know, very, very heavily taken from the writing of Greg Arday. I mean, he's, he, he did a great, yeah, yeah. if it's not broke, you don't know it's up to fix it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of saw and enjoyed and incorporated but i've always felt like that the the role of the magician was different than i felt my role was uh and that the the goal for me has always been uh the propagation of kindness uh the transcendence of the self the eschewing of the ego uh and i because of that have always sought kind of an Occam's razor to things. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, uh, you know, when I when I would read, well, you need a silver bar. I'm like, use a stick of chewing gum. It's <laughs> it's fine. Uh, which is why a lot of my friends uh, tend to uh, kind of align me with with chaos magic, insofar as uh, it is so heavily intention based. Uh, mm -hmm. And that to me is is the end result what i would read i would you know certainly respect and certainly enjoy uh you know the ritual for its beauty but really what i would be looking for is what is this seeking to accomplish and how can i do that in a way where i don't need to be in a you know formal circle right. or with reagents to do you know if i can do it in the subway <laughs> that would be great and so I mean, you're speaking to my own heart and history now <laughs> <laughs> I remember we used to do we used to do kind of 
create and craft sigils and we actually used to put them in subway lines like at each stop and we'd have friends up and down the east coast put sigils in a series on the on the subways when people saw them they would activate a part and all that energy in our minds would go up and down and propagate with different people so just you know talking about chaos magic we used to have to kind of debate because chaos magic really isn't people view it as kind of a tradition but it's not it's like a it's like a foundation it's like a foundational toolbox sandbox kind of a way to approach it and you know i used to kind of consider myself or describe myself as a chaos magician when i realized that that wasn't totally accurate it was like i'm just kind of a magician i do all the magic that comes to me and i explore it but chaos magic's a a good term and kind of meta tradition that and i'd say it's one of the only ones that is named that kind of approaches it like that where it's like this is your tradition specifically this is the path you have decided to take so but yeah um yeah tell me more about your train of thought on that on oh um tradition well not tradition but you know how you don't you've kind of eschewed more traditional paths but you've incorporated things that work for you that Yes. You found move to, you know, you've you've expanded that in your practice and kind of made your own. And you've defined in your book, in a seal, sigil, and call, kind of the basics in the beginning of the own kind of paradigm you crafted. And I'm really excited to talk about things like Adalons with you. And for, you know, people haven't had a chance to meet you yet, our listeners, because this is, your book's going to be released. And I, I like your terminology in calling them Adelons. But before we get into that, do you mind giving our listeners a very, we well, don't have to spark notes, you can elaborate as much as you want, but a little bit about the system that you follow and you express in your book. You know. So in Seal, Sigil, and Call, uh, I have detailed a system that, uh, that I call Panidolism because it is focused on the fact that there are spiritual intelligences uh, within mm-hmm. and around us called Eidolons that we will be able to interact with. Uh, but the foundation of that is the foundation of being able to keep a centered state, to be aware in the present moment, to balance your energy, to connect yourself to universal energy, and understand that it is you know, your birthright as a conscious being, and to do so safely, to do so respectfully, uh, and to do so powerfully. Uh, one thing that I always see, I, I don't feel as if I do magic. I guess is the way to put it. I, I feel like I am magic because in my paradigm, you know, magic is in conscious and all permeating force of reality. Uh, and we tap into that. We think with the mind of magic. We yes. extend the will of magic. Uh, and for me, that is also very important in my own paradigm that is done for the highest good uh, and done kindly. Uh, you know, I do believe that is probably the kindest and highest thing we know is the ability to be good to other people. And I would agree with you, especially in terms yeah. of magic as well. And I know a yeah. lot of people, you know, in the community, you know, there's a lot of cynicism. And sometimes, like, I feel a little cheesy because I, I also have, yeah, I, I have a similar foundation of where I perform magic. And, you know, I find the idea of, uh, kindness and compassion to be paramount no matter my attitude or mood or what i'm doing and i actually just wrote a small post about it on social media about it you're just kind of thinking about how you know when i'm in service to someone else you know when they need when they're in a need often not even in you know something i'm approaching where somebody comes to you it's like my magic if you want to call it that just my inner self like explodes with fire like my magic becomes so potent and focused and i know what to do and it seems to be that that position of kindness and compassion as you said uh and i don't know if any everybody's like this but it just it makes you more of you able to do a work because you're doing it for the right reasons you're doing it i i almost look at magic as like like the primal force of creation that is living and alive and feeling that we're all part of that can be utilized to create wonder and create harmony and make this reality better and as magicians that we have a skill and responsibility to do so whether it's practically and helping others or you know creating wonder and an artistic 
or spiritual sense in the world. But I, I appreciate it. I appreciate that take. And I know some people might cheese on us for it because there's a, a lot of people focus on the practical aspect of magic. Like magic is just about getting things. And I, I appreciate that too. I think there's room for everything because it's infinite. But um, your You're position same wavelength. Of, of, huh? What's that? You and I are on the same wavelength. I think so. I think so. And uh, I try to have my branches in a lot of different trees, but I, I appreciated reading about that and hearing it. Now, how do you, having that focus on kindness and compassion in addition to your magical work, and I want to get back to hearing about your system too, but what, what is your kind of journey revealed to you coming from that position? What opportunities would you say you've been able to do good that you couldn't have done without your practice and without magic? So at the at the ultimate level, uh, I suppose we would call it uh, mm -hmm. after having practiced for many years uh, and hopefully many more years. Uh, there, it was kind of a culmination point. In the beginning, it was very exploratory. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of it was personal growth work, uh, making myself ready to be a force of good, which includes looking into yourself and understanding the patterns in yourself that are not beneficial to yourself or others. And uh, my practice helped me a lot with that. Uh, but after that self-transformation, uh, I, I refer to it often as glimpsing the mechanism. Having mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seen something of the kind of ineffable and ultimately incomprehensible framework of existence. Uh, you know, the idea that you know, I can't hear what a dog can hear uh, and I certainly can't comprehend on the level, you know, and, and disincarnate and all-encompassing consciousness can. But I can glimpse. And you can you can stick your head into Ain Solf's dorm room for a second. Yeah, exactly. And pop back. You just it's like, man, I I, I can't tell you what that was, but that was pretty weird. <laughs> exactly. And excuse my profanity and vulgarity. <laughs> Go on. And the. Being able to see that pattern becomes very much like listening. I use a lot of musical metaphors in my writing because it's it's the oh, yeah. nearest thing I can compare it to. Um, it's the idea that there is a there is a tone, there is a pulse, there is a mood, uh, and that is conveyed through vibration, just the way sound vibrates air. And I've been able to be places at times I would never have thought I would be. Uh, mm -hmm helping people in ways I didn't know was helping them. Uh, I just followed where the melody led me, and I found myself being able to offer things to people that they needed, and sometimes that is something magical, uh, something you know esoteric in nature, and sometimes it is food, or directions, or advice, or someone to listen. Uh, you know, I, I don't choose what people need. Uh, I have a, I suppose, when we consider a, a deck of things that I am able to do, and mm -hmm. those are the things that I am sent to do uh, when operating with with harmony. Uh, so I, that's yeah. <laughs> no, I, I absolutely love how you put that and again i don't want to keep saying like oh me too me too but definitely me too like uh, the way you explain i also use kind of musical analogy but i don't meet a lot of other people who do especially in terms of synchronicity and you know the idea that the the universe whether it is or can be very well described as essentially you know like a symphony you know just an infinite variety of frequencies all vibrating differently and that's you know an idea that really rings true in the heart of many traditions, but beyond that, you know, actually a lot of new scientific thought as well. It's not really, um, we are reaching that point, but it, it's a good, and I, I don't want to say that, I kind of like rambled, I'll edit that part. <laughs> that idea of frequencies and reality and that, you know, we can tap into them is something that i don't know for you but that's something that i learned more from experience itself more than i ever read in a book but it aligned with a lot of different ways of looking at that idea and we do we look into a lot of what you know most a lot of people call like paranormal or i like to call high strangeness which isn't 
which is the weird, very weird parts of the world that aren't necessarily aligned. They're not necessarily about like a magical practice, but, and one of my favorite ideas that a lot of the varied weird things that we've researched and in reality seem to point at is that there is a frequency like nature to dimensionality it's going to sound pretty cheesy when we say it more say but that is a really good way to describe it that and that kind of functions in with even materialist science and like the electromagnetic spectrum that energy everything is energy and it's appearing and existing in different ways depending on how fast or in what way it's moving like maybe quantum level if you want to look at it like that but it extends past the physicality and into the liminal which is where us magicians can work. So I appreciate you saying that. And I think it's a good way for people going to be digging in your book as new people having that foundation, not only morally, but as you've said, you know, you, you tap into that frequency and that current. And when you do, that current leads you to the places you need to go, maybe different from your practice. But I talk a lot. So I want you to tell me more about some of the parts of your system. What's what, are you, what were you the most excited about writing about? In what I was of, the most excited about writing about was probably, Yeah, so what were you excited to share with people that you knew you hadn't really been shared before? Something you kind of had realized through your experience and that you've developed or had taught to you that you were like, you know, this is something I never see people do or, you know, kind of reflected in similar ways. So I want to share it. Like, what are some, yeah. what are some so, things you got? A lot for me, and I think you and I probably could exchange a lot of book between one another. I think we have similar bookshelves just from what you were just saying. <laughs> but uh, yeah. for me, the thing I was most excited to share was mostly in the in the second half of the book, I'd say, because the first half for me was imparting wisdom that had been given to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I in no way invented you know the LVRP, uh, and in no way did I invent the chakra system at all. Uh, you know, these are very, very common, uh, ancient and respected esoteric modalities, but they were foundational. Uh, and so the first thing I needed to do was impart a foundation, because mm -hmm. then with that key in hand, they could approach the doorway that is the second half of my book, which has to do with all of the eidolons and other techniques, uh, things like vestiges uh, and the use of tonality. So... For me, it was sharing what I call the, the inner host of the arc, which is the 18 Eidolons in the book, uh, right. which was a, a long process before writing could even happen of gaining that consent to do that uh, and making sure it would be it was like having a lot of editors with me. Right, uh, right. I only editors with a lot more invested because I was writing about them. So, Yeah, and uh, probably in a way that... Um, those intelligences had never really been described and explained before. So you definitely had the, like the, Hey, you're representing us for the first time. Don't mess it up, kid. <laughs> yes. Yes. Something like that. They, we have a, I've had a very long association with all of the, uh, intelligences in this book. So it's pretty cordial at this point, but, mm -hmm. uh, but I still felt a sense of you know, responsibility of gravity because even if, even if, you know, for instance, the first Eidolon, who's very uh, easygoing, <laughs> it was well, tell us about it. Like, well, tell us about do whatever it. you'd uh, whatever you'd want. I feel the responsibility to make sure that you know it is given the most accurate and useful description as possible, so people can resonate with that on their own terms. Right. Um, and, and I know you do include um, essentially sigils and seals for the Eidolons yes. in the further part of the book, and. And that's, of course, something that extends beyond any individual practice. Sigils are like, uh, you know, like the tel like the cell phone numbers, you know, the personal IDs, yes. their stand-ins for the identity and true names of those entities themselves. So yes. the fact that you gave it to us means that anybody diving into this book when it comes out are going to be able to, you know, start working with them as they work up right away. And I like the design. I really love the design for the seals. Now, the seals for your Adalons. Are they images that were given to you by the Adelons? Did you develop them or, you know, creatively yourself to connect with them? Or was it kind of like a both? It was almost kind of prior. 
uh, they they were given to me through meditation and the same meditation way that I detail in the book, which mm -hmm. is to meditate and receive that sigil, look through the seal, and eventually a sigil you will assign yourself. So the seal sigil and call the title, which was mm -hmm. originally a uh, much more of a mouthful of a title, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> is that way because a seal is uh, a unique symbol, a uh, collection of symbols in a circle, it's always in a circle, uh, that represents that Eidolon and allows one to inform them that they are attempting to contact them. So it is very much like telecommunications, like a cell phone number. You can They can ignore the call yes. uh, or they can answer the call. Uh, and from meditating on that, you will come to discern things about the Eidolon that you were attempting to contact. This is if you were attempting to contact a new Eidolon. The book provides 18 for you. Uh, mm -hmm. And you do mention the, inside oh, that there are, of course, an infinite variety if you keep looking, I suppose. Absolutely. I mean, my own home has more than 18, but uh, the theoretical number is limitless. It is limitless as it is. There are qualities in the universe. And once you have a seal, you would then call the Eidolon um, you know, there's a certain formulaic uh, call you can use that I let out for people who want that, and but there's also the ability to just craft your own, get poetic with it, uh, and eventually the the role of a sigil, uh, which is used a little differently in my terminology in the book than one normally thinks of it, is a sigil for an eidolon is a very small representation of some core tenet of how you associate with them. Um, Interesting. The First Eidolon uh, is a creature of, of music, of vitality, of joie de vivre, uh, of um, kind of those ephemeral moments of enjoyment uh, in life and seizing them and living in more of them. And so for them, when I use a sigil, which is kind of a shortcut, uh, I will use uh, either a, a lyre or a harp. Uh, or or a goblet uh, drawn on a slip of paper because the entire crux of the practice is that you begin with a deeply meditative self-cultivation and contact of these intelligences and the end goal is to be able to call them to you instantaneously to have their help in any way you may need it and uh, eventually even to invite them to come into your life in a pre-agreed way whenever that trigger happens. So I might say, you know, I, that is the uh, idea of becoming a guide for that Eidolon. So saying, this Eidolon is going to guide me. So whenever I need help, they are welcome to come to me, even though I have not called them in formal ritual. Uh, and later on, there is the forging of emblems, which is uh, an agreement that is essentially saying, when I do X, uh, you know, you will respond by helping me in way Y. Uh, and that becomes a much more quick, free form, once again, do it on the subway kind of interaction than, yes. you know, I now need to light my candles and burn my incense and put on a robe. And, you know, that is wonderful and has its place and is indeed something you will do in this book if you so choose. But the end goal is to be able to affect change and affect good uh, instantaneously. Get that power at your hand. Can I you ask a question real quick? Oh, yeah, I was going to ask you. You've been, I've been taking over this conversation. Octavian. Well, no, that's good. I think that's a good thing. Um, but no, my question is, for people who haven't read the book yet and may not know, what is an Eidolon and how does it compare to the classically understood concept of a spirit, let's say a goetic spirit yeah. or an you know, a fae or anything like that? See, we're on the same line because I was literally going to ask him that question and I was going to be like, <laughs> Octavian, get in this one. Yeah, so, so we, we're both going to ask that. Then I, I'll answer both of you. <laughs> so for me, an Eidolon is, is a classificational term. Um, and I classify Eidolons loosely into three groups in the book, but I also make it very clear these are my working groups, and like everything in this book, what I have set them forth for is for other people to absorb and use. Uh, I, I don't want to simply be didactic. I don't simply want to each a subject. I want to light a fire for magic in people uh, that they can use these puzzle pieces that I've given them 
to put together any picture they want. And they can take that puzzle piece and they can file it down and they can reshape it and they can do what they want with it. Uh, as long as they have it there for themselves. Uh, I'm just happy that they are able to use it and it will bring them some good and some of hopefully course. development. So for my classificational terms, uh, I classify Eidolons into primals, uh, other world spirits, and celestials. Uh, and these are really just catch-all terms, and they're vibrational terms, like we were talking about before, uh, about the universe being in wavelengths. And a primal spirit is a spirit that vibrates at one would consider a, a lower frequency, which is not to say it is a, a negative frequency, uh, because that association happens very often, but it's simply denser. It is so maybe not- something... Could you uh, like classify that as uh, like chthonic? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I was going to say maybe a, a earthbound or sublunar or you know, specifically chthonic, because we have all these different terms, but often we should be describing the same kind of things Agreed. in different ways. But continue, please. And for, for other world spirits, they're things that vibrate on a similar wavelength to us. They are the things that are kind of the easiest to communicate in a human way. Uh, I talk about all the Eidolons and how communication with them is most fostered. And primals, for instance, are kind of difficult to linguistically communicate with. Uh, sometimes, because they are not operating in that level. They are operating in a level of forces, in a level of, you know, geological time, things like that very often. And they're not the easiest to say, oh, hi, how are you today? Uh, But they can be communicated with very often in emotion, inspiration, image, things like that. A other world spirit is able to communicate in any way you and I can communicate and more. Uh, and therefore, they are very, very good things for first contact if you're picking an Eidolon to speak to first uh, because you will find it less difficult to translate. Uh, and they can be anything. That's the thing. These are classificatory <laughs> terms. So, you know, an otherworld spirit could be a fake creature. It could be a deity that is accustomed to manifesting itself in a way that people can speak to. Uh, it could be an elemental spirit uh, that is closer to this realm and understands how to communicate with incarnated beings that use language. Uh, and the third classification I use is a celestial. And a celestial is a creature that operates at a higher vibrational frequency. Uh, they are always aligned with highest good. They are incredibly easy to communicate to, not because they are linguistically inclined, but because they can just give you thoughts. They can give you images. They can give you inspiration. They will know what you're saying without you having to say it. It's not something you have to describe. Sorry. That tracks, and um, there's an old term that I, I'm not not sure where it came from or the source, but it was in reference to kind of how angels and other similar beings, how their mind, so to speak, works, which is they're just instant knowledge. They can transform and they can transfer and they, when they need to know something, they just know it in that way. And they can convey that to you as well. And and the term that I used to use was intellectus. And I think that came from medieval source, like a, you know, an old angelology source. And that was kind of how angels processed and transferred data. They called it intellectus, which is just knowing, like you just know when you need to know something, you know it in full and can trans- translate it because that idea of boundaries and, um, you know, the linguistic barriers that humans have to use. Like we have idea, we have intention, then we have idea, then we have to translate it into, you know, a thought process, then we translate it into words, then we convey the words through our voice, through the void to another person who then retranslates it and tries to catch the same idea and beings perhaps on the level you're describing as celestials you know i say that tracks because they don't and maybe other times of spirits or adelons as well they don't need to have that that long process they just they get the intent and it translates to intent and then it takes the form your brain will transform it into words or symbols but they're like all right well this is for you (laughs) thank thank you for the word intellectus i'm going to keep it it just popped into my mind and and i think because that's you know that's an idea and an experience that i've had through my practice too and that's that's the word that i don't know where it came from but that was the word you know (laughs) for that but continue and octavian i i know this is you know this is kind of like our conversation and 
I think maybe JR's approach to the path is very different from yours, but I, so I'm excited to get you guys talking about it. And we are both, especially Octavian, is very he's interested in a part of his foundation, his work is the objective reality of spirits and working with them and getting them to manifest in the most real physical way as you know, to not only study and learn about them, but to work with them in a very manifesting practical results kind of way. And there is a difference kind of between the foundations of how, you know, these two kind of frames of thought kind of are, but they're, they represent two very large groups of people I'd say in a culture. And I don't personally think that they need to be in conflict and it's usually a, it's the idea of the terminology we're using, but as you were describing your Adelons, and I want you to go back to that, um, it's generic but useful. And a lot of my personal work is also quantifying and qualifying different spiritual beings and thought forms. And on that thought, well, Octavian, you lead this this part of the conversation. I want to hear about objective and then internally focused spirits and, and the difference between them and if there should be. The one thing that before you answer that question, I wanted to ask you about is the um in your experience in in the years that you have been doing this, how physical and how material have have the eidolons been uh that you've worked with, and is that something that is important to you, or is that a uh a take it or leave it kind of stance depends on on the eidolon. I will say that there's not a ton of physical manifestation in my practice because it's not my own focus. But like I say in I believe the first chapter, uh, you know, we all define our own paradigm and they're all valid. Uh, mm -hmm. Exactly why I say I say you know I personally choose to to follow the art from a transcendentalist perspective. Uh, but you know we're magicians and we still need to pay our rent and we still need to do many other things that magic can help us in. We still need to heal the physical body. There are many many things that a magical practice can aid one in, and they're all valid ways to use it. Which is why the first step in my book is defining your paradigm. Answering yeah. the question of why do I practice magic? What do I believe it is? Uh, and those are there's no right or wrong answers for those things. But for physicality, I have often, and I, I say this as well in the book, I've often seen the physical world as kind of a puppet show. Uh, you you know, do it, state that in your book. It doesn't feel to me like, and this is this was from before I had the kind of experiences where you come back and you go, wow, you know, I am living on a on a film of algae on top of a very deep pond that I don't understand. But even when I was young, I knew I was like, this isn't real. Like my, I drove my mother insane because she was like, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I was like, why? This is, this, this is a metaphor. <laughs> and she was like, you need a job. <laughs> so, uh, I think my young me had a conversation with, with young me about somewhere like this is all an illusion and then yeah. the other side of me was just like yeah this illusion is gonna like kick your ass if you don't pay your yeah, rent though exactly and I'm like, you're, you're right you're right <laughs> i was like i need health insurance in this illusion so probably get on that <laughs> but, uh, but for me there's not a lot of physical manifestation because it's not something i usually ask for insofar as if you're talking about physical manifestation in the way of you know the movement of objects, you know, and inter interaction with flames and wind and things like that. They're, they're, I've experienced a little of that. But for me, what is a physical interaction is the change of events in my life. The mm -hmm. manifestation of situations uh, and things that I have thought to manifest. So is it physically... trying to think of where is it physically apparent uh, that work has gone has happened not necessarily while the work is happening but after the work has happened when the goal of that work has been accomplished you retrospect retrospectively can see the path it yes. took yeah i think he was was going more because it's it's he wants he likes it when spirits show up physically in a circle looking weird and that is one of his goals, and not not to say that that is easy to do in any tradition, but do you think that that kind of 
and I personally don't require it either, but I, I do find it an interesting goalpost because, you know, spirits and any kind of these intelligences, they will communicate with you in the ways they they do and they are liminal and exist on an energetic level beyond the physical. So, you know, as you said, I, I, mean, I can give you my perspective through a story. So I'm a devotee of Akate, which all yes. our listeners know. Um, and she, I have been working. See, I, I hesitate to even say working with her because what I do is I set up my altar. I say my things. I ask for something. And then that thing happens. But there is no two way interaction. I can't even guarantee that it is her that she that bestowed what I asked upon me. It just happened. And while that is great, and I obviously take great, you know, take great enjoyment in that, the the conversational aspect of it is something that I very much crave: is being able to uh, talk to an entity and and define the specifics of what it can do, what it can do for me, what I what it wants for me, you know, stuff like that. And uh, that is something that I have always been very very much into and, and wanting to experience myself. So when I say physical, that's usually what I mean is having that very direct two-way conversation. Hey, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Because when I think of physical, I think of like ectoplasm. <laughs> right? uh, so that, yes, I mean, that is, is my entire practice. Uh, you know, I I suppose it would, perhaps it's a bit flippant to, to use this term, but I mean, I've been doing this for a while now and I feel like I hang out with my idolons. <laughs> Uh, you know, I def- there's definitely a, a two-way communication. Uh, now, often this happens also through deep meditative practice. Uh, so in Feel, Sigil, and Call, I talk about forming a temple of mind, uh, which is creating a visualized thought space for you to do the work, no matter what your physical hard earth surroundings are. Uh, and in that space, the ability to receive eidolons and have conversations with them uh is is a very common thing for my practice and and i would hope would be a common thing for anyone who followed this path although i don't know how long it would take them to achieve that particular state because as i said this is something i've been doing my whole life but everyone learns and interprets at their own speed and i should hope that people will be conversing with eidolons uh various and sundry yeah the idea of the or the the practice of setting up the mental temple or, or mental spaces is important, not only as a cross tradition, you know, personally, of course, and in kind of my personal tradition, it is it is a foundational thing. And I, I love how you go into them in the book and give examples and kind of direction to do that later on. It's a little later in the book, but um, well, let me not take over again, Octavian. I really want to hear your thoughts. And well, for you, how would you say that the work in like the system and the work that you present and the teachings you present in your book and the, in these systems for somebody with a practical mind. And and I will say that I am kind of more transcendentalist myself. Like when it comes to really good interests, um, you have the three categories of kind of how people approach magic and kind of as I think improve, you call them improvement oriented excuse my, excuse my pause i was trying to find the exact thing where so i have your book in my lap i've been reading through it and i really like it but you know you have your three kind of approaches on why somebody would approach magic where it is essentially self-improvement or then creating you know practical change or you know, doing more practical level magic where you can, you know, get money or, you know, cause you know, something in the material plane to change or you're engaged in it. Empowerment, that was the word, empowerment. It was improvement, empowerment. And then you're at a cool word, which is kind of just doing magic and learning because you want to learn and it's awesome. And you want to learn more about the universe. And I, I resonate with that because honestly, I think that's where I fall. But for the practical minded magician, how well do you think some of the techniques presented in your book would benefit them? Because I know we could talk about the transcendentalist aspect all day, but let's yeah, go in that direction as well. Of course, I think they would be very beneficial uh, because I'm not, I would never say that I've never used my techniques for practical end. 
Uh, mm -hmm. It's just not the main focus of my practice. Right, uh, of course. But when you think of an Eidolon, for me, uh, you know, there are different ways you can think of an Eidolon. You can think of an Eidolon as a non-extant internal subconscious entity. So you're essentially hacking your own subconscious to achieve things. Uh, right. The way my practice has gone, I don't really define them that way. Uh, because uh, I have achieved you know, yeah. enough communication with them and enough effect with them that I don't know if necessarily that would be something I would be manifesting through my subconscious. But then again, I don't know everything. Uh, but for an Eidolon, it is a root protocol and level of existence that resonates with the thought pulse. So if you think of you and I and incarnate beings as still being part of the you know, eternal oversoul, uh, we are limited by the senses we currently possess, and an Eidolon is not. And because of that, it can be used as a conduit to information and a conduit to effect. Uh, what you do when you call an Eidolon, first in your circle and then later when you have a working relationship to your side, wherever you might be, uh, what you are attempting to manifest is between the two of you or more, because you can have a convocation of Eidolons I speak about, uh, where you have multiple geared towards working certain effect or certain end goal for you. Uh, so if you are looking for practical manifestation, you can achieve that in that way uh, because it's a tool. Uh, it is a, a command. It's a macro. You're doing something to achieve something. But what I'm trying to give you is a programming language. Uh, Absolutely. Than, I, li I like okay, how you frame it in that way, too. Like, and, and you use the, the analogy of, of programming um, in terms of how these entities and practices work. You know, not suggesting that it's all a big machine, but it can definitely and sometimes functions in that manner. And that is a, it's something I utilize as well. Um, so I was looking through your book. I really enjoy and I want to hear more about you have something called the white thread man the white thread meditation and you incorporate chakra work energy works using that system and you incorporate it with um like the middle pillar and kabbalistic work and and something i don't see often and again it's that's kind of like my daily practice kind of thing so i want to hear about it you have a lot of work and meditations focusing on different colored lights and energies and you have a wonderful depiction of doing the Kabbalistic cross as and you're showing and depicting in the book the axis of those energies in a plane. I think that's very important. Could you go tell me a little bit about it? Yeah. So for me, the reason the white thread meditation came about was because I tend to fluctuate. I probably use the LBRP more than the chakra meditation. Uh, mm -hmm. But I use both. But there are people... I, once again, accessibility was a, a huge goal of mine in writing this. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons I specify, you know, that this is to be interpreted as, as you wish. Uh, because yes. I don't want anyone to say, well, I can't do this because, you know, X, Y, Z. Uh, you, can, you can do it in your way. Uh, yes. No matter what. And there are people I know who are uncomfortable uh, with some of the imagery in the LBRP. And there are people I know who don't really resonate with the chakra system. So the white thread meditation was something to put a new spin on. Something that didn't have a pre-existing tradition. It's just it's a meditation that I developed for people, including a few of my friends, who weren't really comfortable with any of the other ones. Uh, and it goes towards the same goal, which is you are drawing down, I suppose. Down is directional words are, are odd in some ways because I feel like, you know, the universe and, you know, magic itself is already in you. It's not right. coming down from anywhere. <laughs> but no, that, is, that, is a, that is a thing. Like, you know, direction is actually really important descriptively, but... And, and utilized in these rituals and how these energies move. But in reality, there's not really any such thing as actual direction because we're talking about spaces that are beyond such concepts. Pull my yep. hair out. <laughs> uh, or essentially 
quote, growing down, just to, yes. to visualize it coming into you or from what is already in you growing, uh, and connecting to the plane that you're on, translating that energy from the completely indecipherable well of cosmic energy through your planar situation into yourself, uh, and doing so without any prior tradition. And that was the goal of the white thread meditation. Uh, as for the Kabbalistic axis, is what I would call it. Uh, yes. To me, whenever I did the Kabbalistic cross, and this is once again coming from my uh, somewhat, I suppose, uh, quarter like mentality <laughs> towards mm. various techniques, uh, I had done the Kabbalistic cross many times, and there was always something missing to me. I was saying, you know, we are expanding outward and to the left and to the right and above and below. Uh, but what about the other plane of the three-dimensional existence that we live in? Mm -hmm. And so for me, expanding it to that axis uh, or the Kabbalistic axis is uh, kind of a, a logical step. Uh, it's yeah, I going can see that. To the horizon, both before and behind you. I can see that. And I, I, I brought it up because I thought that that was, that was good. That was useful. And the way you did that was kind of bringing a little bit of that ritual and expanding to something that kind of is just kind of naturally there. So you, you know, push it to do that. So this is kind of a, not a theory question, but more of a general question. I have a couple of things just from hearing you guys talk. I mean, it definitely seems like you have really thought out this process and this system, JR, and I'm very excited to, to try it out. Um, when one thing that I've always had a difficult time with is, uh, the, the more, I guess we'll call, call them like the Eastern aspects of modern magic, which is, you know, meditation and visualization. I'm terrible at that. I think I cling so hard to traditional magic because there is none of that. It's all, uh, the power of the word is the most, you know, integral aspect of it. And so when someone who, like me, who might pick up your book and says like, I would like to do this, but I'm terrible at visualization. What are some methods that you have that can, um, uh, that they can maybe replace that with or, or even get better at visualiz visualization so they can do some of the things in your book. Absolutely. Uh, so this is something I've always been a very good visualizer, uh, probably from my pension for daydreaming, which has been with me my whole life. I but, hear that. <laughs> the imagination in HD. <laughs> yep. But for me, they're... Visualization is not 100% necessary uh, insofar as if you wanted to replace that with something like sketching or even journaling, saying, you know, conceptually speaking about it in word rather than in visualization in, in a mental sphere, saying, well, I'm going to write, you know, keep a journal and say, which we are, my book does indeed ask people to keep a tome, which is a record of their magical work. Yeah, that's one of the first things that you kind of mention to do i think you said it is you know one half of the beginning of your practice how important it is yes. and so using that to essentially write about your things you'd like to manifest write about what your let's say your people of mind might look like uh would work if you're having trouble visualizing there are a lot of good techniques out there for uh helping you to to develop the eye of visualization uh but it's not something I have explored a whole lot because something that comes naturally to me. Uh, but I know there are a lot of good techniques out there. I know people who use dream journaling uh, as a way to kind of awaken that part of the mind. Uh, and I know people who use uh, things like forest bathing, being out somewhere calm, uh, surrounded where you can draw in with your senses, many things around you. Uh, but I think journaling is a really is a really good one or sketching even. Uh, to be able to put those ideas into manifestation without having to do, you know, kind of that uh, formal visualization meditation. Well, that's really cool. And that, that gives me a lot of ideas on how to kind of go forward uh, with your book. Um, before we end the main show and go into the patron show, where can people find you in your book, JR? They can find me at jrmascaro.com uh, or jrmascaro on Instagram. 
and you can find Seal Sigil and Call uh, anywhere where esoteric books are sold. You can ask for it. I always like to support small businesses, but you can also go to Amazon if you need it tomorrow uh, or Barnes and Noble or directly from Llewellyn. Oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna when it becomes available. I don't believe it's available at the time of this is, interview. It is available. Is it? Yes. Oh. A week ago. Only one oh. week. <laughs> okay, so that's even better because I was gonna say that you know I'm gonna throw up you know links to get your book and where people can reach you on on all my social media too because uh, I think uh, a lot of my personal uh, peers and network will find a lot of value in it. So. Yeah, anybody listening, you'll definitely be able to find JR's work. All right, JR, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, for everyone who is a patron, we will see you over there. But anyone who is not a patron, please sign up. It's only $4 a month, and you get access to so many extra shows, including this one. So thank you all so much, and have a great night. And that was our interview with J.R. Mascaro for his book, Seal Sigil and Call. He was a great guest. We loved having him on, and we cannot wait to have him on again. Link to get his book will be in the description below. If you would like to hear the rest of this conversation, you can go over to Patreon and sign up. It's only $4 a month. You get access to this episode, plus much more. Also, every all patrons get access to ad-free main shows. So thank you all so much, and we will see you again in the Strange Dominions.